I will summarize a recent piece that the council has produced uh, called the more balanced narrative, setting the record straight on active management. As if you can move forward, Karen, just one slide. Um, we, we think about this balanced narrative. I think one of the most important things we have to do is sort of accept and, and uh, recognize some of the key strengths that passive has offered investors. I think Karen has, has highlighted this. The council's mandate is to sort of push back against the overly simplistic narrative that you know passive is good and uh, that the passive is good and active is bad. But really, we also need to accept that they can both play a role, an important role in portfolios. And so with that, we sort of very quickly, we sort of highlight many of the benefits here that you would see within passive management. The idea of you know, relatively strong performance, particularly in certain asset classes, maybe that are rightly or wrongly perceived as being uh, more efficient. Clearly, uh, there's a benefit to having lower fees, and we'll certainly dive more into that. And there's also this perspective that in many cases, indexes or passive management uh, can be more tax efficient. And while all those are true, if we move to the next slide, Karen, we think all those strong benefits of passive need to be put into a broader context, again, to, be, to have a bit more deeper narrative relative to active. So certainly performance has been strong in areas, but as we'll highlight, it really varies by asset class, by time period, and by market cycle, as well as a whole bunch of other variables that might play into it. So it's not simply that passive is sort of winning everywhere and all the time, and we'll spend a lot more time on that in a few minutes. In terms of fees, uh, fees are certainly important. There's no doubt about that. But fees should always be evaluated within the context of the value that's being added. And so as we'll, as we'll show in a little bit, fees are always important, but we don't think they should be all important in the decision making. We think it's misleading investors to think if you just buy the lowest fee product, you'll get the, the right or the best or the most appropriate results for that particular client. And then tax efficiency has to be put in a larger context too. Sometimes there's confusion between the tax efficiency of indexes and the ETF structure itself, many passive investments being housed within ETFs. We would also highlight that uh, over half the investable assets out there, particularly around retirement accounts, the tax efficiency argument uh, obviously wouldn't apply. Uh, and then I, I would also remind folks that there's nothing about active management inherently that makes it tax efficient, tax inefficient. There are many active managers that use loss harvesting tools and other strategies to make their actively managed portfolios more tax efficient. So again, these are all sh solid arguments, but they need to be put in a more broad context. If we move to the next page, we'll sort of walk through kind of the agenda of what I'm going to cover over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you see a thumbnail sketch of kind of the paper uh, that's available to be downloaded at the Active Managers Council website. And really what I'm going to address are kind of the three main arguments or critiques that you often hear passive investors level against active managers. And they sound a little bit like this. First, there's an empirical evidence that active managers on average aren't or don't outperform the indexes. And we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time there. Then there's a theoretical argument that active managers on average can't. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as the zero sum theory. And we're gonna dive into why that's important, but maybe not as airtight as people like to believe. And then the third argument that's often leveled against active management is that, well, even if you could outperform, there'd be no way to, to identify those outperforming managers in advance, sort of the selection argument. And we clearly don't think that's true. I'll finish with just a slide or two on the way that active managers are actually adapting uh, relative to the pressure that passive management uh, has brought. And we think there's actually quite a good story here. So that's kind of the agenda I'll tack. If we move to yeah, the next slide, Karen, perfect. So the first thing we want to talk about sort of the performance and the performance is often summarized in what we refer to as kind of the industry scorecards. One is the S&P 
index versus active report, often referred to as the SPIVA report. And then many people on the call will also be familiar with Morningstar's active passive barometer. So two very interesting reports. They cover much of the same ground. We highlight, though, that the methodologies have some similarities but some significant differences. The S&P, the SPIVA report, uh, does not include fees when it calculates the performance of the passive alternative, whereas Morningstar does include the fees. Also, the way different share classes are handled uh, are, a bit, are a bit different as well. And the SPIVA manage, uh, measures the number of actively managed funds that underperform, while the Morningstar Active Passive Barometer measures the number of funds that actually, active funds that outperform. So similar ideas, but these are sort of, and you'll hear me refer to the industry scorecards as we go forward. This, this is really kind of where the active passive de debate has often been, where the rubber has met the road, and where a lot of the, the broad financial media gets a lot of their data from. So we'll dive into these and spend a little time with this in terms of what are the factors that are driving active versus passive. If we move to the next slide, one of the most important things that we highlight is that it doesn't matter whether it's one of these two industry scorecards or any one of the thousand academic uh, research papers that have been done, different methodologies for how you calculate active returns versus passive returns can lead to vastly different results, especially on a whole bunch of variables that we mentioned, whether we're looking at just gross returns or net of expenses, uh, whether the benchmark uh, or index fees are included in the calculation of passive returns or not which benchmarks you're using. Some studies use broad industry benchmarks like the S&P 500 for all large cap uh, US equity. Some studies use the specific prospectus benchmarks like say the Russell 1000 value or the Russell 2000 growth. Uh, how we handle share classes is important uh, because there have certainly been some trends over the years in which share classes and the expense ratios of those share classes and how they affect performance. Obviously, uh, the results will vary based on time period and horizon. We spend a lot of time thinking about survivorship bias and something called reverse survivorship bias. Uh, I would summarize this by simply saying, yes, if you only look at surviving active funds, you will overstate the strength of active. But if you assume that all funds that were closed underperformed, you're sort of underestimating the results of active management. Uh, mutual fund companies and asset, asset managers close funds and strategies for all kinds of reasons that don't include bad performance. Uh, so in a lot of ways, the numbers are overstated to the downside. There's also a question as whether we're trying to measure uh, the outperformance of the vehicle or the skill of the manager and therefore should distribution costs be included or not included. And then many of these studies adjust for risk adjusted returns. So yes, some clients only care about their nominal returns, but in academic framework, investors should always care about what their risk adjusted returns are. Long story short, you can get wildly different results even by looking at the same numbers just by using different methodologies and different assumptions. If we slide to the next, page. We, here we just offer one example. Uh, this is kind of if you're an investor and you're wondering, you know, you ask yourself the question, I wonder how active managers have done in the high yield bond space over the last 10 years. Well, going to the two, you know, main industry scorecards, which would, would give you wildly different results. Uh, Morningstar would tell you that over the last 10 years, th through the middle of last year, that almost 60% of active high yield bond managers have outperformed while the S&P index versus active report would say that number is under 5%. So again, you just get sort of a, a sense of, if you make a few changes to your assumptions, you can get wildly different results. If we slide to the next page, I sort of just highlight the period effect and the cyclical effect. So here we've just taken a couple of different Morningstar categories, US real estate funds and corporate bond funds. And sure, if you said over the last three to five years, wow, real estate funds have really struggled, but in the last year, 70% of them have outperformed uh, their indexes. So clearly something is different is going on here. 
almost the mirror image in sort of corporate bonds, you might say, wow, 60% uh, of corporate, corporate bond, actively managed corporate bond funds have outperformed over the last three and five years. But in the last year, only a little bit more than a quarter of them have outperformed. So again, this is just a very tiny slice of the broader reporting, but it gives you a sense that this narrative that all funds in all categories are struggling relative to passive. It turns out that a more nuanced and deeper dive into the performance of active management shows that there's a lot of variability between strategies, styles, and different time periods. Many managers are doing quite well, and some are struggling in different periods, and it really depends on the market cycle and some other variables we'll talk about in a minute. If we slide to the, to the next page, thanks, Karen. Uh, here we look at just one smaller slice, although this is one of the bigger asset classes. This is active U.S. large cap blend managers, so core U.S. large cap relative to, to say, an S&P 500 or the large passive benchmarks. And here we go all the way back to 1984, showing data, the long cyclical trends that have occurred in active versus passive. You can, the, as the line goes down, this is the relative performance between the, the uh, aggregation of all the active large cap blend funds uh, divided by the performance of the S&P 500. Again, indexed to 100 at the beginning of 1984. You can see we had a five or six year period where actively managed funds struggled. We had a four year period where they dramatically outperformed in the early 90s. They underperformed for about a five year period in the mid to late 90s. And then active managers had a fantastic 11 year run from basically 1999 in the tech bubble through the beginning of the great financial crisis. And as most people are aware on the call, large cap active US has struggled since then. I think this really shows that it's a much more interesting and nuanced story. People will look at the last 10 years and sort of conclude that active management has really struggled. Whereas in a longer perspective, we can really see that active management, like all things, goes through different phases where it underperforms and where it outperforms at other points in time. We slide to the next one, Karen. Uh, so why does performance vary across time? I won't go into detail here, but I will highlight a really important fact that people should know that if you add up all the active managers uh, in a particular category, you will not get a portfolio that looks identical to the benchmark of that category. There are systematic differences between the way active managers run portfolios and the way indexes are constructed. And these systematic differences go a long way to explaining why active managers on average and in, 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 in aggregate would fare better in some market cycles versus other market cycles. And I'll just highlight very quickly a couple at the bottom because they are relevant for the current cycle. So uh, not surprisingly, cash and market direction are important. So obviously in a rising market, active managers who tend to own some percentage of their portfolio in liquid or cash investments, not fully replicating the overall market exposure, they may tend to lag, they'll have a little bit of a headwind in up markets, and they'll tend to have a little bit of a tailwind in down markets. Now, don't misread that statement. That doesn't mean that on average, active managers will outperform in down markets. They may, they may not. We simply highlight that as a single variable, this tends to be a headwind in rising markets, a tailwind in falling markets. That isn't an opinion, that's sort of basic portfolio math. We also highlight market cap distribution. Most active managers in aggregate cannot be overweight the largest stocks at the same time in an index. So not surprisingly, when the largest stocks in a market cap index have the strongest performance, that tends to be a headwind for active managers. And when smaller cap stocks, maybe the Russell 2000, but even think about smaller within large cap, the bottom 400 stocks in the S&P 500, when those small and smaller cap stocks outperform, that will tend to be a tailwind to active managers. And this doesn't apply just to equities. You see the same sim similar trends in bond portfolios. Most active managers will have a little bit more yield, a little bit more credit. So generally speaking, not in every environment, 
but when credit does well, active managers have a bit of a tailwind. And when credit underperforms or credit spreads are widening, that will be a little bit of a headwind. Again, none of these are hard and fast rules, but they give you a sense that there are systematic differences between active managers and their underlying indexes. And when those differences are in or out of favor, they will tend to drive in aggregate whether the average active manager is doing better or worse. We move to the next slide. You know, really the key takeaways for me from the first part, uh, we believe that the industry scorecards are helpful and can even be insightful, uh, but they are not gospel. They are hardly pre precise to any stretch of the imagination. Remember, their findings can be radically different simply because of small methodology or assumption changes. We think that a deeper look at the empirical evidence uh, highlights that performance between active and passive has, very, very, has often varied by asset class, time period, and market environment. And we don't think people should extrapolate the, the struggles that large cap US funds have had in the last seven or eight years to sort of indict all active managers uh, in all the other spaces. And we do think that if you understand the systematic differences between active managers and their benchmarks, you can have a much more robust discussion about why active managers are outperforming or underperforming in a typical environment. The most important takeaway here is that we think that the, the notion that active managers do well in some environments and not in other environments really makes it much harder to come up with these catch-all arguments that you often hear leveled against active managers that markets are too efficient or managers lack skill. If you remember those slides from the previous page, it's highly unlikely that markets were massively efficient in one period and that meant man active managers struggled and all of a sudden markets became wildly inefficient and the active managers did fantastic. You know, likewise, it's unlikely that all the managers were foolish in one period and underperformed and all of a sudden became geniuses in the next period. We think these catch-all arguments are way too simplistic and aren't supported by the changing cyclicality that we see between active performance doing better in some periods and worse in other periods. On the next slide, we really attack the, the second argument. It's, it's this idea that there's some kind of arithmetic proof that active managers on average can't outperform. Uh, this was, was first popularized by Bill Sharp uh, in the early 90s. It's often referred to as the zero sum theory I mentioned earlier. It sounds something like this. You've probably heard it. All investors together, all active managers and investors form the market. On average, everybody's gain has to be somebody else's loss or everybody's positive alpha has to be offset by everybody else's negative al alpha. So when you add it up, you basically get everybody in aggregate alpha or excess return has to be zero. And then the active managers charge a fee. So it's this idea that there's some kind of proof uh, that this is the case. And while we'll argue that the zero sum argument is powerful, uh, it is true that active managers do have to take alpha from somebody. We think there's a real misunderstanding of how or mismatch of how this lines up against how active and passive is measured. So a couple of ways that that's happened or that happens uh, is we highlight there's really two mismatches here. The first one we call skew and the second one is slippage. The most important thing to remember with the zero sum theory is that, in, that when, we, when we're measuring alpha or excess return, we're talking about total dollars. Every dollar uh, that somebody earns is a dollar that somebody else loses. That's the zero sum theory. But remember, when we go back to the industry scorecards, we're not measuring dollars. We're measuring what we, we call hit rates or success rates. And the dollars and the hit rates do not need to align with each other. So, the, so while the zero sum theory measures dollars, the industry scorecards, which you often read about, are measuring percentage of managers or hit rates. So what is, so we have two things, skew and slippage. Skew is how this could be moved across managers and slippage is how you could lose it uh, in between categories of managers. We highlight that on the next slide. So <clears throat> here we talk about skew and on the left-hand side, uh, we, we show two very similar tables here. 
We have five managers on both sides. And in both scenarios, we've given them assets and a certain return of alpha. And we've made it so the, the total sum of alpha is 0% and $0 at the category level. But notice if the returns are skewed across managers, and on the left-hand side, we've given one of the managers a lot worse returns than everybody else, well, they suck up a lot of negative alpha and they provide positive alpha for everybody else. And so in this particular case, we show that the zero sum alpha doesn't mean that half the managers were low perform. Here, 60% of the managers are outperforming. On the right-hand side, we could also skew the assets. So we give them similar returns, but we make one of the managers much bigger. The bottom manager is much larger than the other. He has good performance, so he's sucking up a lot of the positive alpha, leaving more than 50% of the managers underperforming. So again, it, it, it isn't at all true that just because the alpha has to equal zero, that 50% of the managers have to underperform. On the next slide, we highlight this other term called slippage. And here we just point out that these measurements are not a closed system. So we've just made up an example here, uh, which is uh, the US bank loan category, uh, for example, in Morningstar. And we highlight that, yes, while the zero sum of alpha across everybody that is trading bank loans, and that might include pension funds, CLO managers, insurance companies, other mutual funds that are you know, non-US mutual funds, while they are all trading amongst themselves, and, and we may you know, sort of grant that the alpha may be zero, it doesn't mean that the alpha within that category that we are measuring is actually zero. It may turn out that one of those categories is systematically taking alpha from other investors, or maybe it's systematically conceding alpha to other managers. If we move to the next slide, we sort of sum up this key point uh, by saying, yes, it is true that alpha is hard to come by and you have to take it from somebody else. But simply assuming that alpha equals zero does not mean that the hit rates on the scorecard have to be lower than 50%. And we show that, that, that alpha can both slip and skew across different managers. So when we add it all up, we do agree that Sharpe's zero sum arithmetic is very compelling. Uh, again, you have to take, it, does, it means that active management is not an easy game by any stretch of the imagination. However, it does not in any way, quote, prove, again, people highlight this as a mathematical proof that on average, active managers can't outperform. As we move to the next slide, the, the, the third and, and final sort of argument leveled against active managers is that it's really hard to find managers, even if they could outperform, you could never identify them in advance. And we think this is also a bit off the mark. So the first thing that we highlight on this slide is, usually when people try to identify outperforming managers, they over rely on something called performance persistency, or think of that as performance consistency. And it's sort of, there's this search for persistent manager uh, outperformance. We would highlight that while consistency or persistency of our performance is great, we, we'd rather have it than not, it shouldn't get in the way of making money in the long term. Karen really hit on this. What's important that investors are generating the best returns they can or the best risk adjuster returns that are designed to meet their goals. The goal isn't to sort of outperform the index every day or every week or every year. And so again, most investors, as we highlight on the right-hand side, would probably have a manager that has a higher return and maybe underperforms a bit more often than a manager that maybe outperforms more than 50% of the time, but has a lower return over their investment horizon or over the long term. And I would argue that most active managers, when you speak to them, completely understand this inherently. Most will concede that good active managers need periods of short-term underperformance. That sort of you know, coils the spring and allows for the longer periods of outperformance where they can generate some excess returns. So in our view, a lot of people try to equate persistency with the ability to find a manager, and that's really off the mark in our view. If we go to the next page, we do like to high, highlight there, there is no magic formula for identifying 
great performers in the future. But there's been an enormous amount of research done on this. And again, for the sake of this webinar, we'll, we'll move you know, as quickly as we can. We've just highlighted a few different variables that are commonly cited in the research. And here I'll come back to cost. Remember we said early, cost is important, but it's not all important. Our view is, is that cost is important and maybe it's skewing your manager search away from the most cost prohibitive. It doesn't necessarily mean you, that if you buy the cheapest manager, you'll always get an outperformer. But generally some of the most cost prohibitive uh, make, make that hurdle much higher. We also highlight portfolio assist, uh, excuse me, portfolio efficiency, or what some people refer to as, as benchmark differentiation. This is just the idea that a good active manager has to be different enough from the benchmark to actually outperform the benchmark. We, we, I call it portfolio efficiency. What I really mean is, is enough of a particular portfolio invested in things different than the benchmark. That's the only place alpha can can come from. The things in the benchmark can only generate beta. And then when you combine uh, benchmark differentiation with a longer time horizon, there are several studies that have been done that show that investors who have a longer time horizon that are more focused on fundamental economic uh, signal as opposed to short-term trading noise, when combined with less benchmark overlap or more differentiation, those two variables can also be a good source of finding out performers. On the next slide, we just, we go back to this idea of cost really quickly. Again, this is from the active passive barometer uh, last year. They do a very interesting study that you can see in the color on the right hand side, just comparing uh, the top decile versus bottom decile uh, active manager performance by cost. And here, in this particular period, we noted that for the 10 year period, in 17 of the 21 categories that Morningstar analyzed, moving from the highest decile expense ratio to the lowest decile expense ratio worked in 17 of those 20 categories. And on average, increased your probability of finding uh, a manager that would outperform by 21 percentage points. So again, fees are not all important, but they are important. We move to the next slide. We highlight benchmark differentiation. Nothing more than I already mentioned. Remember, only the portion of the benchmark that is different, and only the portion of a strategy of an actively managed fund that is different than the index can actually drive excess return over that index. So there are good reasons to have some overlap with the benchmark, but that has to do with tracking error and managing risk and those and, and perhaps volatility. But when choosing an active manager, we always want to be looking for managers that are sufficiently different that they can generate enough return to overcome their fee hurdle. So again, it's no magic elixir, but it's an important distinction. In, in active equity portfolios, this is often referred to as active share, but there are other me measures like tracking error, uh, and even in fixed income, just being sufficiently different from your benchmark or having out of benchmark exposure. So clearly, you know, to just summarize the manager selection part, uh, I would really just highlight what we care most about is long-term compounding of wealth. We think uh, that this I, people are placing too much uh, emphasis on the persistence of performance. We don't think you can find great active managers simply by chasing past performance. And we don't think people should be overly focused on persistence. And while there's no sort of magic formula, we do think there are a couple of variables uh, and, and factors that are highlighted often in the research, uh, again, that I covered, focusing on fees, focusing on being different than your benchmark, and potentially having uh, a longer horizon. These are things that come up repeatedly in the research that do not guarantee you'll find a strong uh, or an outperforming active manager, but certainly go a long way to tipping the scales in your favor in terms of having a higher probability of finding a manager that will outperform in the future. And then, uh, you know, as I finish up, uh, I really wanted to talk very briefly about kind of the future of active management and why we're so excited about it. The pressure uh, that, that uh, passive management in the last decade has brought on active management, 
I think is really causing the active management industry to up its game. And I highlight just a few ways here uh, without going into any detail. The continued decline in cost, again, cost is not all important, but it is important. The emphasis on risk management, again, uh, there's nothing wrong with owning an index, but we have to admit that if you're simply buying a broad market index, you aren't getting any specific risk management. Remember, when you buy a broad index, you're buying the market, which means you're buying its full upside capture and you're buying its full downside exposure. It doesn't mean that active managers will necessarily outperform in a risk off or a bear market scenario but at least they have the ability to or the option to that by definition the broad fully invested benchmarks do not and we think as markets get choppier investors will will find that trait to be helpful uh, we think that portfolios are getting more operationally efficient this is what i was describing earlier uh, you know tracking error is sort of going up portfolio concentration is rising and managers are focusing their portfolios to be different enough from the indexes uh, uh, to, to, to generate alpha over their expenses. And I would, I would finish by saying uh, not to just bring up ESG because everybody's talking about it, but at the Active Managers Council, we believe that ESG is almost part and parcel of active management. The, the underlying data on ESG factors uh, really illustrates that they're not very consistent and not very correlated. So as a result, uh, we, we think that uh, active managers are, are almost by definition the, the single best way to implement uh, a sustainable or an ESG focused portfolio. Again, uh, not everyone will agree on the ratings of a particular company. And so as a result, there is a perfect intersection between environmental, social, and governance sustainability ratings and where excess return will come from in stock picking. And so we think ESG is a great frontier for where active management is going. My last slide, Karen, I'll sum it up as quickly as I can. I don't wanna take up any more time. The scorecards are important and insightful, but they, we do think they oversimplify the story. Uh, they're helpful, but they're not indicative by any stretch. We see that active managers can and do outperform, but it certainly varies across category, style, time period, and market environment. We think investors can improve their odds of finding a good active manager going forward, and we don't think relying on persistence measure is very helpful. And we think the future of active management is really bright, as in all the ways I just described, it's really adapting to the challenges of the, of the new market environment and the challenges and the, and the growth and assets from passive managers. 